Chapter 27 Vatican II in the Light of Tradition The following is the preamble to Dignitatis Humanae of Vatican II. Religious liberty does not involve any prejudice to traditional Catholic doctrine. Moreover, speaking of this religious liberty, the Holy Council intends to develop the doctrine of the most recent sovereign pontiffs on the inviolable rights of the human person. It is this preamble which is supposed to be reassuring that immediately precedes the conciliar declaration on religious liberty. It is presented thus as being written down in the line of tradition. But what is it in reality? The question arises about the fact that, as we have seen, the popes of the 19th century condemned, under the name of liberty of conscience and of forms of worship, a religious liberty which resembles, like a sister, that of Vatican II. Let us now look at a side-by-side -side view of Quanta Cura of Pius IX versus Vatican II's Dignitatis Humanae. Proposition A, condemned by Pius IX in Quanta Cura. The best condition of society is that in which there is not conceded to the authorities the duty to repress the violators of the Catholic religion by legal penalties, except when the public peace demands this. Proposition A as asserted by Vatican II in Dignitatis Humanae. In religious matters, let no one be impeded from acting according to his conscience, in private or in public, alone or associated with others, within just limits. Proposition B, condemned by Pius IX in Quanta Cura. Liberty of conscience and of forms of worship is a right proper to every man. Proposition B, asserted by Vatican II in Dignitatis Humanae. The person has a right to religious liberty. This liberty consists in what follows. In religious matters, let no one be impeded from acting according to his conscience. Proposition C, condemned by Pius IX in Quanta Cura. Religious liberty must be proclaimed and guaranteed in every correctly established society. Proposition C asserted by Vatican II in Dignitatis Humanae. This right of the human person to religious liberty must be recognized in the juridical order of society in such a manner that it constitutes a civil right. End quote. The parallel is striking. The analysis of this brings us to conclude that the doctrines are contradictory. Father Congar himself admits that Dignitatis Humanae is contrary to the syllabus of errors of the same Pius IX. Father Congar writes, It cannot be denied that the affirmation of religious liberty by Vatican II materially says something other than what the syllabus of 1864 said, and even just about the opposite of Propositions 16, 17, and 19 of this document. End quote. Vatican II is materially contrary to Pius IX, but not formally. That is what the supporters of the conciliar text pretend. They are specific. The condemnation of religious liberty in the 19th century is a historical error. The popes condemned it, but according to the modernists, in fact, they intended only to condemn the indifferentism which was then inspiring it. Man is free to have the religion that pleases him, therefore he has a right to religious liberty. In other words, the pope struck too hard, blindly, without discernment, through fear of that absolute liberalism which furthermore was threatening the temporal pontifical power. Father Eve Congar takes up this explanation and quotes his sources. He writes, Father John Courtney Murray, who belonged to the intellectual and religious elite of the elite, has shown this by materially saying quite the opposite from the syllabus. 
The latter is from 1864, and it is, as Roger Aubert has proven, conditioned by precise historical circumstances. The Declaration of the Council on Religious Liberty was the consequence of the battle by which, in the face of Jacobinism and the totalitarianisms, the popes led the fight more and more strongly for the dignity and the liberty of the human person made to the image of God. End quote. On the contrary, we have seen that Roger Aubert and John Courtney Murray are prisoners themselves of the historicist prejudice which makes them erroneously relativize the doctrine of the popes of the 19th century. In reality, the popes have condemned religious liberty in itself as a freedom that is absurd, ungodly, and leading the peoples to religious indifference, and this condemnation remains. Along with the authority of the constant ordinary magisterium of the Church, if not the extraordinary magisterium with quanta cura, it weighs on the conciliar declaration. Father Congar and Dignitatis Humanae in its preamble both assure us that religious liberty is written down in the line of fundamental rights of the human person, as defined by the recent popes in the face of Jacobinism and the totalitarianisms of the 20th century. Let us read a few statements of this fundamental right of the cult of God. Extract from the Inner Peace of Nations Man, insofar as he is a person, possesses rights that he holds from God and that must remain, with regard to the community, beyond any injury that would tend to negate them, to abolish them, or to neglect them. Pius XI's Encyclical Mit Brennen der Sorg of March 14, 1937 The believer has an inalienable right to profess his faith and to revive it as it needs to be revived. Laws which stifle or make the profession and the practice of this faith difficult are in contradiction with natural law. Pius XII's Radio Message on December 24, 1942 to promote respect for the practical exercise of the fundamental rights of the person, namely, the right to maintain and develop the corporeal, intellectual, and moral life, in particular, the right to a religious formation and education, the right to the private and public worship of God, including charitable religious action. End quote. Objectively, the worship of God in question can be the only true cult of the true God. For when we speak of an objective right, the concrete object of the right, such as a cult, it can be a question only of something that is true and morally good. Pius XII teaches, What does not correspond to the truth and to moral law does not objectively have any right to exist or to propaganda or to action." End quote. This is moreover the obvious sense of the text of Pius XI. The word believer and faith refer to the followers of the true religion under the circumstances of the German Catholics persecuted by Nazism. What finally did and always do the totalitarian and atheistic regimes attack if not the foundation itself of all religious rights. The anti-religious action of the Soviet communist regime aims at ridiculing and suppressing all religious worship, whether it be Catholic, Orthodox, or Muslim. What they want to abolish is the right implanted in the subject and corresponding to the duty of this person to honor God, to leave out of account its concrete practice in such or such a cult, be it Catholic, Orthodox, or Muslim. Such a right is called a subjective right because it concerns the subject and not the object. For example, I have the subjective right to render worship to God, but it does not follow from that fact 
that I have the objective right to exercise the Buddhist cult. In the light of this completely classical and elementary distinction, you will understand that in the face of militant atheism, the popes of this century, especially Pius XII, have insisted precisely on the subjective right to the worship of God, a right that is totally fundamental, and it is this meaning that must therefore be given to the expression, fundamental right to the worship of God. This has not kept these popes from claiming besides, when it was necessary, both explicitly and concretely, the subjective and objective right of Catholic souls. But the perspective of Vatican II is completely different. The Council, as I am going to show you, defined a right not only subjective, but objective to religious liberty. An entirely concrete right that every man would have to be respected in the exercise of his form of worship, whatever it may be. No! The religious liberty of Vatican II is situated at the antipodes of the fundamental rights defined by Pius XI and Pius XII.